There's a feeling that's probably, at the very least, somewhat familiar to most of you guys watching this. Say that you're at work and you see on your calendar that you have a big important meeting coming up. Say you are in charge of pitching some ideas for solving a problem at work. Or maybe you haven't even gotten that far yet. Say there's a, there's a job interview for a job that you really want that you're not sure if you're qualified, but you think you are, but you're gonna have to prove in that interview that you are in fact qualified. There's a particular feeling that I think is somewhat common uh, amongst all of those sort of situations. You can use different words to describe that feeling. You could use a word like stress, you could use a word like anticipation, you could use a word like anxiety, but I think all of those words could be packaged under one bigger umbrella. One word that is a lot more positive than some of those other words like stress and anxiety. That word is growth. Oftentimes growth feels super uncomfortable. And I think the reason for that is because you're pushed outside of your comfort zone. The comfort zone is easy, it's literally comfortable. It's not where growth is gonna happen, it's where stagnation happens. That's not necessarily a bad thing on its own, but for some people, maybe you want a little bit more out there. You wanna keep pushing yourself. The way to push yourself is through growth, and the way to achieve growth is to get outside of your comfort zone. For me, as a poker player, for me as a poker player, that's gonna be sort of an obvious uh, spot where we're gonna find that, that sense of growth and leaving our comfort zone. That's all gonna happen in higher stakes. I've talked a little bit about how I don't want to just rest on my laurels in the two five games. I wanna keep pushing myself, plain and simple. When things are going well in poker, I think that makes for a great time to step outside of our comfort zone rather than just stay comfortable. I think it's time to look for some growth and our first opportunity is going to be the 5-10 with straddles game at Hollywood Park Casino. $1,000 minimum buy-in, uncapped max buy-in. Five, five tables of 5, 10, 20 that Brad Owen and I were able to put together as a high stakes sort of meetup game. Definitely not our bread and butter at the meetup games, but uh, five tables, very happy with that turnout. Provided a good scene for us to get out of our comfort zone and hop into some games. I bought into the game for $2,500 and right off the bat, things were going pretty well. I managed to win my first two or three or four hands. There were generally smaller pots, nothing major to report there. Off to a pretty good start. $2,500 in a 5, 10, 20 game is only 125 big blinds. So we aren't sitting incredibly deep, but it is $2,500. And losing one buy-in, uh, even though it's just one buy-in, would not feel great. Losing multiple buy-ins would definitely not feel great. More important than that is that we're here to play. We're here to get in the mix. And in this first hand, we are looking down at Ace, Queen of Spades. The under the gun player makes it $60 to go and only I flat call in the small blind. Could certainly consider a raise here in the small blind since we are out of position. We have a pretty good hand that can even withstand a four bet, I think. But considering that the raise came from the under the gun position, that is going to limit my, my three betting uh, frequency by a pretty serious margin. So I just go ahead and flat call and all the other players fold. So we are heads up to a flop, which comes down ace, jack, eight with two clubs. The plan here is gonna be pretty straightforward. Just going to check call all the way down, even if it's three barrels, assuming the board texture doesn't change too much. So when I check in my opponent bets $85, sticking to the plan so far, I go ahead and make the call. Turn doesn't change anything, it's an offsuit four. I check, once again, my opponent bets $210, I believe. Straightforward situation, I'm going to go ahead and check call here once again. The river changes a lot though. It's another four, but it's the four of clubs. This time I check it over to my opponent and he continues betting to the tune of 300 and about $50 or so. Now we hardly beat anything whatsoever. There's some bluffs we could beat such as king queen, maybe king queen with a club. You might use that hand as a bluff. You'd imagine that if you happen to have a worse ace here, he would check some percentage of the time since he is now using the ace aces and fours with a jack as his hand. He can't get any value from worse, and all he could do is hope to push his opponent off of a chop. We have a pretty hand pre-flop and a pretty decent hand post-flop, but I don't think we have a very good bluff catcher here on this river. We have ace-queen, which means we remove some of the hands, such as king-queen with the king of clubs, that we would want my opponent to have. We don't have any clubs in our hands, so 
we don't block any flushes either. So it's a combination of factors that leads me to believe we should fold this hand, and that's what I do. I let it go, and uh, my opponent does not show at the time, but later on, I talk to my opponent, whose name is Clint. I asked him if he would mind sharing what he had, and I'll put it in the vlog. And he, uh, was ex he was happy to hear that the hand would make it into the vlog, and he told me that he had ace-king with the ace of clubs. That definitely makes a lot of sense. He's gonna wanna go for three streets of value, especially holding the ace of clubs, which removes a lot of potential flushes that I could have. So, again, happy with the way we played that hand. Had a, uh, a good plan once we saw the flop. Happy with my pre-flop play as well. As we can see, the under the gun range is pretty snug. We were facing a dominating hand, so the uh, three bet pre-flop, of course, would not have worked and we might have lost more. So overall, pretty happy with the, uh, the way this hand played out despite the result. In this next hand, we're at a new table and the cutoff raises it up to $60. We're on the button with seven six of hearts, and I think I like this hand as a three bet bluff. There's gonna be lots of playability post flop when we do get called. I go ahead and put in a standard three X three bet to $180, and the straddler decides that's still a good enough price. He decides to cold call, and the initial raiser calls as well. So three ways to a flop. Flop comes down ace, jack, deuce with two diamonds and one heart. Action checks over to me. I think this board favors the three better range. Uh, we do have a, uh, a backdoor flush draw, we don't have any backdoor straight draws, but backdoor flush draw and an A-side board seems good enough to start barreling. Bet away on some turn cards, such as a, uh, a heart. Maybe even a turn pair, if we want to uh, add those as some of our barreling hands. Anyway, I go ahead and see bet for $200. The straddler makes the fold, and the initial raiser makes the fold as well. So, pretty happy with that one. We take this one down with seven high. It's always fun when uh, these these sorts of hands work out. A three bat pot that you take it down on the flop. That's a profit of $375 in a matter of about a minute. So, it's fun, it's interesting. You know, when we step into some bigger stakes games, every hand sort of matters uh, in terms of the raw dollars amount. In this next hand, we look down at pocket fours and we raise it up. There's not a whole lot of uh, interesting stuff that happens in this hand. We end up checking it down versus, I believe, the straddler who called pre-flop. So, the pocket fours, and ends up being the best hand uh, as an underpair. I believe my opponent said that he had king high there. In this next hand, again, maybe somewhat uneventful, but the under the gun player opens it up for, I think, $60 again. We leave down to pocket jacks, very next to act. And again, it's one of those situations where I'm not looking to three bet the under the gun razor with a pretty hand, but not top tier hand. I just go ahead and flat call. Heads up to this flop with our pocket jacks. Flop comes ace high, not a good flop. The initial razor goes ahead and C bets. I peel one off, I float here. The turn doesn't change too much, he bets again. We're just gonna have to go ahead and let these pocket jacks go. It's a hand that's gonna be tough to improve on. We only have two real outs versus the hands that he is representing. We're gonna have to fold on the river unimproved and it's tough to improve. So we let the pocket jacks go. We fast forward a little bit, maybe an orbit or two before seeing an under the gun raise again to $60. We look down at pocket deuces in the small blinds. And again, same situation, under the gun razor comes in for the open and we have a hand that's not really looking to face a four bet, even less so than the, uh, the ace queen or the pocket jacks. Doesn't matter the stakes, folding is boring. So we don't wanna let these pocket deuces go. We're gonna come in, we're gonna make the call here even though it's out of position. The big blind and the straddler call. So this time we are seeing a four way flop. We find a favorable flop in this uh, 5, 10, 20 game. It comes down five, three, two with two clubs. We thought ourselves bottom set. We check it over to the initial razor who puts out a bet of $125. Happy to see a C bet here from the initial razor. Now it's just a matter of flat calling or raising, and I think raise is definitely in order. It's a very wet board. We can represent a lot of hands, flush draws and straight draws and combo draws, maybe even some over pairs. So time to put some more money in this pot. We wanna charge all sorts of holdings such as flush draws and straight draws and even an ace high. So we do that with a raise of $380. If one of the other players behind me happens to have a better set or a better hand somehow, we're just gonna have to get it all in here. There's not gonna be any uh, avoiding that sort of a situation. Anyway, the other two players fold and it folds back to the initial razor. He thinks for a little while and uh, decides that he's not done with his hand. He's not gonna flack all though. He's gonna jam all in. It's somewhere around $1,200 and we are going to go ahead and snap call in this situation. He asks how many times want to run it as usual I say it's totally up to him so he decides on two boards on the first board it runs out with a six but no additional clubs and on the second board we make quads so we're definitely gonna win that second board I just go ahead and roll my hand over knowing I'm getting at least half of this pot pretty standard procedure for me my opponent does not roll his hand over he goes ahead and mucks surrenders the other half of the pot so it's a great feeling things are looking up we win our first very significant pot in this 5 10 20 game it's a pot worth 
over $2,600, I believe. Feels good, you know, that's something that will definitely take the edge off, maybe even bring you back into that comfort zone a little bit, have uh, have some profit to work with rather than sweating uh, the amount of money that you are so far stuck. Somehow, in this vlog, we can always just count on making quads. It's a little weird, it's a little scary, but. Uh... Oh yeah, who does that? All right, in this next hand, we got a bomb pot happening. It's a meetup game, bomb pots are still a thing. $50 a man in the 5, 10, 20, and I think we're playing either six or seven ways in this hand. We got ourselves the Iron, the Queen Deuce, the offsuit variety. Flop comes down Queen 5, 5. So we flop ourselves top pair here. We have no kicker, and since everyone has the full range out there, we do have to worry about better queens as well as some fives. So I'm going to play a Koi for now. I go ahead and check it, and action ends up checking all the way through. The turn is a 10, and there was either a flusher on the flop or this brought in a backdoor flusher. I'm not quite sure. Seems like there's enough that we can get value from on the turn, though. Now we also want to uh, bet in order for some equity to not from over cards as well as charging open-ended straight draws and flush draws. I go ahead and bet it for $125, and only the button makes the call. Turn's a very good card for us. It is another queen, so we end up with a full house. The virtual nuts here in this situation. Just gonna go for more value, pretty straightforward. I bet $275 this time, and my opponent makes the call. Probably an easy one there. Um, always nice when you find some, uh, some hands that work out in your favor, We're playing a little bit bigger. And uh, my opponent did not show what he called with, but um, maybe I could have bet a little bit more there on the river, but then again, uh, he did not quite snap call, um, so usually when that's the case, maybe a little bit closer to maxing out the value, but you never know. Might have been able to get a little bit more value once the board double pairs. Maybe he's non-believing, and again, there's some draws there that missed on the turn. Happy with it, though. Happy to drag in a bomb pot with the Israeli Ron. Once again, jumping over to another table now before seeing the cutoff open to $90. Pretty sizable raise. The button calls as well. And we are in, I believe, the big blind, looking down at the best hand ever created, pocket aces. Very welcome sight, playing in a bigger game and seeing a bigger than average open and a call. We're gonna go ahead and put in a, uh, what feels like a pretty sizable three bet. We're out of position and we're pretty deep. I believe we're over $4,000 effective in this situation and we are out of position. So we definitely wanna ramp it up a little bit, but again, obviously we're hoping to get some action. So I decide on a three bet sizing of $410. I think that's even maybe a little bit on the smaller side. Even though it looks like such a big dollar amount, normally I would like to size my four bets somewhere around 4x the initial raise, plus an additional x for every caller in between. And then you can add a little bit of money based on how deep you are. So all of those things, all those numbers would add up to a number somewhere around, let's see, $450 plus a little bit more if we're deep. So I actually sized down a little bit there, even though it feels uh, kind of significant just by the raw dollar amount. But as it is, doesn't really matter. And everyone ends up folding, unfortunately. We don't get too much action with the pocket aces. But we get the two uh, pre-flop bets plus the straddle and small blind. Adds up to somewhere around a $200 profit without seeing a flop. So can't complain too much, although of course we would like to see a lot more action with these pocket aces. In this next hand, one more additional table to uh, hang out at, at this high stakes meetup game. We're looking down at Queen Jack of Spades on the button. We go ahead and raise it up to $60, standard size there. The small blind and the straddler make the call. So we are three ways heading to a flop. The flop comes king, 10, seven with two hearts and one spade. Action checks over to me and it's a pretty good flop for us with our open ender plus backdoor flush draw. So we put in a C bet for $100. The small blind makes the call and the other player folds. The small blind has about $1,000 left in his stack at this, uh, at this juncture. The turn is a pretty good card for us. It's the five of spades, which gives us that that backdoor flush draw to go along with the open ender. When he checks it over to me, I'm definitely not gonna stop betting here. Now that we have additional equity and the betting lead and probably a range advantage to go along with all those things. We can have all of the sets on the flop and my opponent cannot. 
we're also more likely to have all the two pairs. So we definitely have a range advantage here and we have all this equity. I'm gonna go ahead and continue with the aggression. I make about a pot size wager, keep the pressure on to the tune of $400. And my opponent doesn't think for too long before deciding on a fold. If he decided to ramp up the aggression on his own, if he went ahead and jammed for an additional $600, I'm just gonna have to call it off there. Happy to apply maximum pressure there. Could even go, uh, even bigger, I think. With all that equity and the big range advantage, we could even make a huge overbet and just jam all in there for the $1,000. I don't think that would be unreasonable at all. And in fact, it might even be a better line, but happy with my pot size bet. Happy that it got the job done. We're scooping in another pot. That's what $3,862 looks like, also known as a profit of $1,362. Pretty happy with the way I played for the most part. Uh, towards the end there, I gave away a little bit. Uh, I think at the peak, at my high point, I was up somewhere around $1,900. Uh, played pretty solid for the most part. Um, did manage to win some hands when I almost assuredly did not have the best hand. Um, but pretty happy with the, uh, the board textures that, uh, that I chose uh, as my bluffs. And the only thing that I'm not really happy with was uh, towards the end, pretty much in the last orbit, I played some hands that uh, were definitely a little bit out of line. And just basically, since it was the last orbit, just tried to get a couple more hands in with the guys that were at my table. Um, and you know, when you do that, when you push a little bit too hard, it's just usually not going to work out. Anyway, uh, it's a combination of, um, you know, a little bit of relief when you play a little bit higher and it works out. Um, it definitely feels good, but, you know, $1,300 uh, profit in a 5, 10, 20 game, that's essentially less than one buy-in. You know, it's somewhere between half and one buy-in. I think a standard buy-in is 100 big blinds, so that would be $2,000. So we come out ahead $1,300, but I think more importantly was that I felt pretty com comfortable uh, for the most part. Some of these games were, you know, there was definitely some good players in there, uh, some tough players that are fairly, or not, not, not even fairly, but are definitely successful poker players. Um, and they can definitely be tough to play against. Um, but uh, I think I'm quite happy, like I said, with uh, the vast majority of my lines. It's a little, it's a little uh, raucous out there, a little noisy out there still. Um, some beers are about to be had. Uh, I only had one beer throughout the six hours of play here in the 510-20. I took it pretty seriously and uh, like I said, pretty happy with the result, can't complain. All right, gonna go over there to the bar, the Ray's Lounge is calling my name, gonna have a beer with several folks that are here for the meetup game. And uh, then tomorrow, this, this uh, meetup game train rolls on, 5-5, a little bit less stressful, perhaps more fun, definitely more tables and uh, more friendly faces then. Looking forward to it. I think that the vlog is at an interesting spot at the moment. I think that I feel pretty confident that I've sort of captured my poker story up to the point where I started making the vlog. That story took us up to 510, no limit hold'em. I'm not going to completely stop playing uh, those games such as 2-5 and 510. Certainly there's a lot more 510 to be played here in Las Vegas. And there's also lots more 2-5 and 5-5 games at that level to be played, uh, especially in the meetup games and maybe even lower. And I want to keep doing those things. I want to keep bringing people together. But as far as my personal grind, my personal poker story goes, I definitely want to keep pushing myself outside of my comfort zone, keep pushing into higher stakes, see where we can take this poker story. Maybe that's what the next chapter is in this poker story and this poker vlog.